How's everybody doing tonight? We have another live broadcast for you here tonight. Um, one that's been uh, gotten a lot of good responses online. Um, of course, as usual, I'm your host here tonight. My name is Jeremy. I am the owner and director here at Ghost of the Battlefield, the small little military museum in Virginia Beach. And tonight I am joined by our friend Dan here, who is also an avid history collector, and we share a lot of the same interests. Um, tonight, as you may have gathered by now, we really like interesting things having to do with um, the 8th Air Force in Europe, the bombing campaign there, and all such things. So I'll tell you a story. I'll start off with a story. When I was about 10 or 12 years old, my parents took me to an air show in uh, upstate New Jersey. Yes, New Jersey. And at that air show were two flying B-17s and a B-24. Uh, there's also some other ones, some P-51s. I think there's a couple Navy aircraft. But the point of the fact was, is that the B-17s flew at this air show. And it was a very small air show, so you got a very up close and personal look at them like you probably wouldn't see at a lot of larger air shows. And there, um, I remember very vividly that um, the B-17s went to take off, and my mother, and I know you're watching tonight, uh, took us out to see them take off, and I remember them flying directly overhead with that that uh, very distinctive sound when they took off, and I just remember being transfixed. Um, sadly, the B-17 that we did see that, 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 that day was the 909, which tragically crashed last year, and the other one was the Fuddy Duddy, which is still flying today. Um, left a very indelible mark on me. It left a... Uh, you know, something that changed my life. It was a, a life-changing life -changing event. And I think Dan here probably had similar experiences mm -hmm. when you were young. So tonight we're going to talk about the 8th Air Force in Europe, primarily through the experiences of one man, uh, Staff Sergeant John Ott yep. Sr., who flew as a ball turret gunner in a B-17 named the Sleepy Time Gal. And before anyone says anything else, yes, there are quite a few Sleepy Time Gals. But we'll go into that. Um, this is absolutely amazing photo album. You're going to want to stay around. You're going to want to see this. But first, some background information. The, um, the 8th Air Force was formed one month after Pearl Harbor. It was formed in Savannah, Georgia. And when they started off, they had seven men and zero aircraft. One month later, they were tasked with the monstrous, uh, the monstrous task of defeating the German Luftwaffe. Um, this was an Air Force that had defeated the entire world at this point. It reigned supreme. It had destroyed, well, let's see, uh, driven, into, driven into Russia. It had destroyed France, the Low Countries, Norway, Den uh, Norway, the Scandinavian countries, and it had thrown England off the continent back onto their own island. It was an undefeated force at this point still. And this small, untested group of uh, men was tasked with defeating this Air Force. They would do this primarily through what would become known as daylight precision bombing. And that was, you know, the essence of what they were going to do. And it was an, un it was an unproven very idea. Unproven, yes. It was a very unproven yeah. factor. And uh, just as some real quick background information, 12,731 B-17s were built. Of those, 4,735 of them were destroyed. That would that be in accidents or to enemy fire. Uh, yeah, one third loss rate on the aircraft itself. Um, that having been said, the Eighth Air Force would have sixty-seven thousand casualties mm -hmm. in World War II. Of that sixty-seven thousand, twenty-six thousand will be killed. Of the ones that weren't killed, that's injuries, and, and we're talking horrible injuries yes. here. Of flax splinters, burns, burns yeah, is, a, exactly. is a prime is a very big one, or being taken prisoner, which many thousands were. Yeah. So, so with that said, so let me introduce myself real quick. I'm Dan Kahn. I'm an active duty Coast Guard member um, in the local area station here. Um, and uh, Jeremy was nice enough to you know let me join him in these uh, these talks, and, and I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, myself too. Like I grew up with stories of my my great grandfather flying the hump in Burma during World War II. Um, and 
those those stories have always stayed with me. Uh, long, long history of family in the military. So this is why I love doing this stuff. I love displaying this stuff and talking about history. Um, so before we get into to John Ott's um, pictures and his life, uh, we're going to finish the, the history of the 8th uh, Air Force. Um, so, so kind of picking off where Jeremy left off. So um, the 8th Air Force, uh, they were formulated in Savannah, Georgia. They then... Um, went to Langley Air Force Base in uh, Virginia and, uh, and trained there for several months before actually uh, starting to head over to England. Um, the first contingents went over in early 42. By mid 42, the majority of the 8th Air Force was on its way over to England and training over in England, getting ready for their first missions, which would be come, come up in fall. Um, backtracking a little bit further behind that. So um, prior to Pearl Harbor, uh, the uh, Air Force, the Army Air Force actually only had about a 26,000 person contingent of uh, trainees that were uh, being trained at the various um, facilities. So they had to rapidly develop the training regimen uh, to get uh, enough crews to put together to, to fly all these B-17s and B-24s that they were gonna be flying. Um, so, so it's really an amazing story of how quickly the, we spooled up our training regimen, we got those, those uh, draftees in, and we sent them to various schools. And, and a lot of the schools were throughout the Midwest. You had um, a lot of pilots went to flight schools and everything else, and they, they started their, their, their time there flying trainers and whatnot, and gradually worked themselves up to the, the bombers that they would be flying. Um, and then there were a bunch of sub-schools for a lot of the enlisted men, the, the sergeants and the staff sergeants who would become the aerial gunners. There was aerial gunner school, there was um, yeah, navigator that, school. That was uh, New particular. Mexico, right? Was yeah, aerial gunner yeah, school. That, and Roswell was yep. a bombing training. Yeah, in fact, I think it was Lowry, um, was it Lowry Bombing and Gunnery Range yeah. in Colorado was one of the big ones too. So, um, so there's a lot of training that went into this, and and, and it's pretty amazing that within six months they were able to get that many mem uh, personnel trained up, um, get the crews together, get themselves familiarized while they're in Savannah, and then up in Langley Air Force Base, and then get them over to, to Europe and ready to fight. Um, so, so with that said, you know by fall of 1942. The Eighth Air Force uh, started its, its first bombing missions, and as Jeremy said, like the um, precision bombing was the name of the game early on in the war. And it, it's funny they say precision bombing when you know about ten percent of the bombs actually hit their target um, during during the war. A different but, definition of precision. Exactly, exactly. But um, unfortunately, the the problem with the daylight bombing was that they were they were targets, prime targets for flak. They're they're prime targets for the Luftwaffe, which was at the top of its game um, in uh, early to mid forty two. Um, and the, the casualties that they experienced during these bombing raids was just horrendous. Um, initially, they had uh, escort um, bomber escorts, which were P-47s. Uh, P-39s, And too. P-39s. Um, but, uh, you know, they were only, right they only used uh, for so long. So when, when they first started their bombing missions, they, they bombed various areas in France uh, as a lead-up to you know, D-Day and some other things. And then they, they gradually went further and further into Germany. And as they went further and further, their escorts couldn't follow them them into the um, into those bombing areas, and they were just picked apart. I mean, it, the uh, the numbers, the casualties, the number of planes on missions that went down were were horrendous. Um, um, going back to the the day versus the nighttime bombing, so we were in a uh, campaign. Uh, we wanted to do round the clock bombing, so this was something that they they uh, the Americans and the British got together and said, yeah, like, we're going to bomb Germany um, and the Axis powers. Uh, 24-7. Um, the British were already doing nighttime bombing. Uh, they were trained for it. They were, uh, they had been doing it throughout the Battle of Britain, etc. You know, so they were, they were very good at it. Um, American bombers were only trained in the daytime. So to go back and try to get them to train for nighttime missions was going to delay the bombing missions and, and the war even longer than they wanted to. So um, the, the U.S. generals, uh, Hap Arnold in particular, he he made the decision that we weren't going to go back and we weren't going to train our, um, oh, you mean, our squadrons. You mean, you mean Iron Ass? Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> so we weren't going to train the, the squadrons to fly nighttime because we needed to get out there. We needed to start bombing and interrupting the Axis, uh, especially Nazi Germany. So, um, so that's why we ended up doing daytime uh, precision bombing, as they say. Um, so, but again, that, that, um, that, the, the losses were, were just horrendous. So that leads us up to, you know, big week, which, mm -hmm. uh, was, was some, um, when we say horrendous, we mean you had, when you started off, you had a 33% chance of living, not a 33% casualty rate, mm -hmm. a 33% chance of living through your 25th mission. This was 1943. Of course, once we invade the continent, 
and the Luftwaffe is destroyed, you start seeing a lot of, you know, the, the Luftwaffe is pulled back away and they just basically end up on the ground because they can't fly anymore because, you know, there's tens of thousands of Allied yeah. fighters just yeah. roaming the area. But the, the, the uh, survival rate goes way, way high after that. But then you start seeing, you know, more accidents and stuff still occurring. So, uh, I mean, if, if you, think about it this way. If you were being asked to do a job and you went to the interview and said, well, there's a 77% chance you're going to be killed before your job is done, how would that make you feel? So I always took a lot, I always took an exception to the people that would say like, oh, well, you know, and you see a lot in the movies where they'd say, oh, well, you know, pretty boys, they, you know, they, they sleep in barracks, they have hot, three hot meals a day, mm -hmm. you know, they have dances and girls and weekend passes to London, but you could die literally any day. And like we had said before, these were not pleasant deaths either. There was no, there was no great way to go. I mean, burning or freezing or falling or, or ending up in Pewdiepie camps, but about the best you could hope for. So, so it, it was not a good life to be living. Yeah, not to mention the stress that they felt after missions. I, I can't imagine. Leading up to missions. You not know, imagine how that you know, feels. You know, imagine having to go on a mission like this where, you know, like you said, 30, 33% uh, casualty rate and, and you're, you're going up every no, 33 percent survival, I mean, survival rate. rate sorry <laughs> and and uh you know like every three four days you're going up on a mission they think of you have, no you have, you have 10 on. friends so it's yeah seven of you aren't coming back <laughs> yeah it's insane especially in 42 and early 43 yes, it was yes. it was the worst so uh that leads us up to like what they call the big week it was it you know in uh, mid-october of 1943 um we're talking thousands of bombers on each mission so i mean these are coming from different groups air groups different squadrons and they're all forming up you know Early on in the war, when they, they had fewer numbers, uh, it was a lot easier to get them up in the air without accidents. But as you started increasing the number of bombers that were going in a certain mission, they started to see more and more accidents. Um, and, of course, England's known for its fog. Mm. Uh, and, and it was not uncommon for the fog banks to confuse pilots and whatnot. And it was not uncommon to see you know, flashes in the fog banks. And, and it pretty much everybody knew what happened. At that and point, it, often, you know? it often also so, uh, screwed up um, the mission's uh, yeah, timing so that exactly. you know the escorts wouldn't arrive at the right time. Yeah. The formations wouldn't, wouldn't link up at the same time. Yeah, that's where you start seeing. Curve. That's where you start yeah. seeing the uh, the formation aircraft, where they put mm -hmm. lights on them, blinking lights and yellow paint with big polka dots to try to like, say, you know, try to get that because yeah. the collisions were one of the main killer yeah. uh, of them. And trying to get those formations together, you're, you're dealing with thousands of aircraft trying to go in the same place. It could get rather confusing. Yeah. And then not to mention, you know, going getting over the target. There were there were multiple times where you know one bomb group would get there you know an hour earlier than they were supposed to. Obviously, at that point, the flak gunners are alert and everything else, and the next bomb group comes in, and they just get, you know, smothered with flak. They get hit by the, the um, Luftwaffe comes out. You know, they, you're basically, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there to there's a very interesting easily, training so. video where it talks about, it's literally called flak. Yeah. Have you ever seen it? Yeah. And it, it describes the three types of flak, where mm -hmm. one is a direct fire, one is um, just where they would, they call it a flak box. They would just fire all the guns into a, a square in the, in the sky and hope that would... Mm -hmm planes have to fly through it eventually and it's funny because the the movie is written obviously for airmen uh during the time and it makes such so light of the yeah. fact that it's, it's like these puffs can be harmless you know <laughs> they're just trying to dissuade you from your course yeah by killing you <laughs> but yeah. never mind that and i think every every uh veteran from war ii army air force veteran talks about flak especially if they're yeah. the air force. i don't have the it's numbers on it, it was, I, don't, but... I think actually i think i think that if I'm not mistaken, I think that accidents was the biggest killer, yeah. then followed by fighters and then flak. Yeah. So, but it's still, I mean, I think the flak was psychological, you know. Yes, that, that unnerving. Didn't help. So, uh, getting back to, uh, you know, big week. Um, they, um, come Thursday, October 14th, 1943, which they, they call Black Thursday, um, the, one of the biggest missions that they ever, you know, put together. Um, 291 bombers went out to do a, this bombing mission, and uh, out of that, 60 of them went down. Um, which was just, a, that was even more atrocious than ever any other bombing raid. So One squadron lost every yeah. plane but one. Exactly. So, I mean, it was it was bad. And, and after that point, the, the Army uh, Air Force finally started thinking, like, okay, maybe maybe a daytime bombing without a um, fighter escort was not the way to go. Um, so they actually put a, a stop to the uh, daytime bombing for a while. And um, they, they waited until the end of uh, 43 when the P-51Ds came out. Um, and we're actually able to um, take the, the bombers all the way into Germany and back. They had the range to finally do that. So well, Let's take a sidebar here yeah. to talk about the uh, the advanced Norden bomb site because mm -hmm. obviously daylight bombing was believed to be 
impossible without this new wonder technology where we have the Norden bombsite. And the Norden bombsite was a, a mechanical computer which was supposed to calculate wind drift, mm -hmm. humidity, temperature variations. And the joke was that you could drop a bomb from 10,000 feet into a pickle barrel. Mm -hmm. So putting it right in the pickle barrel is, you know, the, the standard of what people would say. And um, I don't know how accurate really that was. Um, I know that it was, it was a lot better than previous attempts. I know it was a lot better than the British bombing accuracy, which was area bombing anyway. Yeah. And so the British wanted to terrorize the Germans into surrendering. We just wanted to blast their infrastructure to pieces. I think probably they both kind of suited each other kind of well, but neither one was going to win the war, I think. You got to put boots on the ground. I digress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, did you want to show some of the, the sites here? Or? Um, sure. Like, so yeah. here at... This is our little Army Air Corps gallery, and in the beginning of the war, you go from, well, in the very beginning of the war, you go from a gun site that was quite simply just a round steel circle with an X in it, and you had hash marks on it, just like a standard rifle scope, to this piece here, which would plug into the back of the weapon here. You turn it on right there, and it gave you a holographic weapon sight. The holographic sight would allow you to aim ahead of the aircraft, and as you moved your head, you couldn't get too off target because the holograph would stay true to the weapon. Kind of like uh, your EOTEX from today. This is the earliest model, on and off switch. That's it, okay, on and off switch. Then they come out with the K11. This apparatus, a lot heavier and a lot more expensive, bolts onto the back of the gun right here, power cord right here, and auxiliary cord right here. And this gun sight allowed you to calculate all of the variables, or most of the variables, and then that would translate to the holographic weapon sound on top. You could change it for how fast you were flying, at what altitude, uh, the instructions are written here on the top, and then on the side here, you had a fine tune adjustment, and a day and night switch, which was interesting. Actually, no, it's an emergency switch, I don't have my glasses on. So this would be standard illumination, and then if that died, you could switch batteries to, uh, or the bulb to another bulb, which is encased right here. But, again, holographic weapon sight, a lot more expensive, a lot more um, precise, but it still had, in case all of this stuff died, it had an emergency flip down, little iron sight on top that would allow you to continue to fight once this thing froze over or broke. I never thought about that. Yeah. Probably freeze over pretty readily now, think yeah. about it. At that altitude, yeah. Yeah. So. Again, K-11 gun sight sits on the back of the 50 cal. Can't, can't believe this actually survived the vibrations of that whole <laughs> ordeal. We had talked about flak a little bit, and there were many remedies for that that the Air Force would, would give out. And um, there were both flak jackets that were worn and flak helmets, yeah. which were designed to help alleviate some of the stress from splinter hits. And whatnot. This is the second model flak helmet. It is, a stand, it is essentially a GI M1 helmet that has been cut on the sides and cut on the side for ear flaps so you can wear it over your headphones like the ones I'm wearing on my head. And this was the second model. Again, designed to fit over the leather skull cap. Excuse me, ma'am. Fit over the leather skull cap, which went inside like so. I'm holding it backwards. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> there we go. Heading forward now. Uh, this is the second model. The first model was just a rear M1 helmet that they put, actually had a, a press, they stuck yeah, it in and stretched it, in, it. Stretched it out, yeah. And then they wore it backwards, so that way it didn't bind up on your head when you wore it, so that way you can look Shows up. you how the equipment we were back yeah, early on in the war. Yeah, catching up. So. And then they went to a second one, which didn't have a brim on it, and it had longer ear cuffs, and they went to another one that was covered in nylon, it gave you a little bit more blister protection. Uh, the jackets were very, very heavy, and Tonight, in the gentleman that we're going to refer to, he was a ball turret gunner, and in the ball turret, you didn't have any room to wear the flak jacket. The ball turret was supposed to be its own armor, yeah. which I don't know how good or bad that <laughs> was. Um, we'll find out. But um, flak jackets, heated clothing. Yes. Uh, you see right here the leather jacket, and then over here are a couple other ones. Temperatures at altitude and i forget that there's actually a mathematical coefficient yeah, i forget what it was but it five was, degrees yeah. for every thousand yeah. feet or something or every hundred is is tiny but the temperature would get very readily to 30 below zero which means that if you touch bare metal with your hand it would freeze right to it so it's like you know uh remember a christmas story where he 
puts his tongue on the flagpole yeah. and gets stuck. Well, I mean, think about that. You take your glove off for a second, you go to clear your gun, and guess what? Mm -hmm. Now you and your gun are permanently together. And that's that's not good because yeah. the only way to get it off is to rip the skin off. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Ugh. And they didn't have doors on those things. They were just a no. window that was open to the air. Uh, the, the B-17s yeah. and 24s were not pressurized at all. There was no temperature control, unlike the B-29 that came out later. And it was absolutely abysmal for the crews. Um, the B-17 did offer. The, they had the blue Smurf suits that you wore underneath. This was electrically, yep. electrically plug in. I, I was wondering about that though. Like, what happens if it got wet? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And. Being in such a stressful situation, I can imagine it getting wet. Yeah. Sweating, definitely, and then and that, had to worry about that on the way back. That, sure. that other thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the conditions were horrendous for the guys too. I mean, like, like what the, um, you, you, what those guys endured on the on the missions, and we're talking like 10, 15 hour missions. I mean, it wasn't anything anything short. It, it was a long day and night, um, coming back, having to deal with fighters, having to deal with flak. Um, and, you know, a lot of times damaged aircraft coming back. So a lot of times, you know, even coming back was, you know, hit or miss, especially since a lot of them were damaged. And the crews had to do all sorts of things just to keep them up up in the air and get home. I know that a lot of guys so. survived bleeding to death by being frozen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd get hit in an extremity and it would freeze. Exactly. exactly. But it would keep you alive. So. So, yeah, I mean, so um, just, just finishing up here with the 8th here so we can get into uh, Mr. Ott's grouping here. Um, so... Throughout the war, um, they uh, they continued bombing um, Germany all the way into 1945. Um, and some of the stats here for, for what they did, um, they dropped uh, over 440,000. Well, they actually uh, completed over 440,000 bombing sorties. Um, and that's not every single group, but all their groups and all the squadrons together, that's how many they um, they had actually accomplished in those three years. Uh, they dropped 697,000 tons of bombs. Um which Lost. is nothing compared to Vietnam, no. though. Yeah. <laughs> World War II was pretty yeah, impressive it's number. Like, it's like three B-52 yeah. loads. <laughs> and then uh, over 5,100 uh, aircraft were lost. Um, but they did score 11,200 aerial vic victories uh, during the war as well. So that's between the, the actual bomber crews themselves uh, with the 50 cows and the 30 cows yes. that they had. Yes, yes, on, on, on The B-17 killed more enemy aircraft than any other aircraft. Correct. Yeah. That is true. So, of course, so, we have to understand that this, what, that this was large scale warfare and it was very indiscriminate and mm -hmm. so untold numbers of civilians on both sides were regrettably killed and this was the carnage that was world war ii and the leadership understood at the time that the only way to reduce casualties was to end it as fast as possible yeah. and that meant being horribly brutal yeah. unfortunately especially once they started doing fire bombings and yeah stuff. the yeah, fire bombing like, of dresden was... and and yeah um <laughs> it, it does get rather gruesome there yeah. So tonight we have a special treat, and this this is very 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 neat. This is the personal photo album of Jonathan Ott Sr. He was a staff sergeant in the what which was the squadron? Three hundred eighty fourth bomb group. Um, in the three hundred and sorry, um, three three hundred fifty second uh, bomb squadron. And so. I'm going to actually move out and get okay. the camera moved. And I'll, so I'll pick this up. You want to so, go ahead and we'll go through yeah, it. Yeah, real briefly. First of all, hopefully uh, Miss Judy Ott is on online here and she's able to, to tune in here. Um, she is my uh, wife's aunt and she was the one who uh, was gracious enough to trust me with these uh, these wonderful photos and history of her father. So, um, you know, part of the reason I love doing this stuff is so that you can uh, spread the word and... Um, tell the history of uh, what the greatest generation did for us during World War II. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if it weren't for them, none of us would be here. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, I'm very honored to have this collection and be the caretaker of it. Um, and I'm uh, very honored to be able to tell the story a little bit here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open it up here. Here's uh, John Ott here. Um, he was born in New York City. Um, you know, like so many other um, members of the greatest generation, you know, he had to endure a lot. Uh, growing up, he he definitely he went through the Great Depression. Um, he you know, had challenges with that, like every family you know pretty much suffered through through that uh, period of time in the United States. Uh, coming out of the Great Depression, you know, um, they they had to find work. Um, he actually uh, worked for the Civilian Conservation Corps before uh, being drafted uh, during World War II. So he um, 
And she went and was working in the Pacific Northwest. Um, not sure what projects exactly he did, but the Civilian Conservation uh, Corps was uh, was essential to building the infrastructure in the United States leading up to World War II. And if it weren't for a lot of the roads and a lot of the, the construction projects that they did, it would have been uh, very difficult for us to to accomplish what we did during World War II. Um, so he's already you know serving his country doing that. Um, he was uh, he registered in uh, for the draft in 1940. And he was drafted into the uh, the U.S. Army uh, sometime in uh, early '42. Um, so, as best as I can tell, um, after getting through basic training, um, he uh, probably you know went to several different uh, schools um, throughout the Midwest. Um, pretty certain he went to um, uh, Las Vegas Army Airfield for flexible gunnery training. It's pretty much where most of the uh, the uh, members who were who wanted to be gunners. Uh, would go for training um, pr prior to joining their squadron or their their bomb group uh, for for heading overseas. Um, so he he probably went there and a couple other places throughout the Midwest. Um, at some point uh, during that time, he was assigned to the 381st Bomb Group. All right, whose um, origins start in, early in Dece in uh, January of 1943 in uh, in Texas. So uh, that's where the 381st uh, was, was uh, initially put together. Basically, all the pilots who um, became uh you know you know, got through flight school all the gunners and and everybody came together they were all introduced as a um as a crew and they began doing their their flying training uh stateside before they went overseas um so they started there in texas uh, eventually went out to colorado um and you'll see in here there's some pictures that that note uh you know b-17s over over denver say hello um, to your wife dan so, she's watching oh hi Aaron. um <laughs> so um so it's really really cool stuff here um so uh, without further ado, before you know, I get into some of the other stuff, I want to go ahead and start coming through some of these pictures here. But this is John Ott here. He was a ball turret gunner on uh, the Sleepy Tom Gal. Um, it's actually a uh, Sleepy Tom Gal, and we were talking about the names of uh, the nose art and everything else. Um, it was not uncommon for, the, for uh, air crews to use the same name. So there were several Sleepy Tom Gals uh, that were, were um And they reused the same pinups, too. Yeah, they <laughs> reused the same pinups. There were several Liberty Bells, etc. So there were a lot of different... Um, aircraft that use the same names, but this was his aircraft. Uh, he's got some pretty amazing photos here. These are, um, I'm pretty certain these are photos uh, taken while they were training in Colorado, which was their final prep for going overseas to England. Um, so as you can see here, some pictures of the inside of the, the B-17, um, and then he's got pictures of his crew here. So that that is uh, uh, John Ott there, um, and you've got his uh, the co-pilot here, Lieutenant Dill, and a couple of the other guys. Um, this guy's yeah. like yawning. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so it's pretty, pretty cool. You can see in here, this is not the same uh, same, same picture plane, of yeah. a Sleep Tom Gal, and that's why I'm pretty sure this is the training plane that they were oh, probably yeah. using. So this is probably why. why well, I can I see why. This is, this, is, so, this is an F model. Yep. You can see it's got the... It's, it's, it's older, yep. Yeah, it's late older F model. Yep. It's got the cheek blisters, but so, because the chin turret is what gives exactly. it a G. Exactly. So this is what they, they trained on in stateside and then went over and, and had the more uh, modern B-17. So really cool. It's amazing that he had the pictures of the... Um, of the crew here. Um, what I did was a lot of times there was uh, writing on the back or on the bottom, and I tried to just keep the writing on here to try to keep it so you can actually read what he had on the back here. Um, these, these next couple pictures are kind of going to bounce around a little bit, uh, but here, here's part of the, the squadron he was with, uh, so the 352nd uh, Bomb Squadron, um, and, and some of these pictures show uh, show uh, some of the crew. Here's their, this, I love this picture here, just the, the kind of their um, their barracks room where they're in their lounge area and all the pinups and stuff in the background um, This is probably more likely in England here is what I'm guessing when they went overseas We have a comment here from Stephen yep. that um, his uncle Lex flew in the top turret of a B-17F He never got to meet him, but he did visit his final place in Arlington It's a um, it's a great story. We, we're, you're hearing from a lot of guys who's who's um, relatives flew in the 17 and in the 24 and it was that's why we do what we do because so much of the history is lost and we just never get to hear the stories and well a lot of people didn't talk about it either but that is one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing yeah, it's amazing to be able to pass this forward um so anyway yeah so some of the some of the pictures here um i see here here's a thanksgiving dinner in, in uh, england so like i said it kind of bounces around a little bit but in 1944 oh. this, so. is, this is a great lead-in because if uh, for those of you on a page yesterday of course yesterday being thanksgiving you saw the post about how when the Americans began to arrive in England, how the English is opened up to the Americans. Of course, Thanksgiving is an American holiday, and you know the English didn't really understand it, but they quickly threw it together, and uh, they even opened up um, the uh, the name of the church there that that uh, had never been used for anything non secular for Thanksgiving Day ceremonies. 
Um, so Westminster so these, Abbey. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Westminster yeah. Abbey. Um, so these are some pictures um, just prior to 3D first uh, actually heading over to Europe. Um, so I'm thinking a lot of this is in Colorado. You can see the barracks buildings. It was very common for the barracks back then. Uh, they were basically just covered in tar paper. Um, and you can imagine up in Colorado and, and in the Midwest in the, in the middle of January how cold it must have been for those guys at times. So, um, so these are just some pictures of, um, uh, of them hanging out in their barracks uh, during the training time. Um, obviously, I think they got to go home at some point. They, they got to you know, do some hunting and you know, it looks like they got a turkey or something in that picture. So it just shows that, you know, while they were stateside, they still had, they did things and they, they had, had a good time back home. Um, a few other pictures here. Now this, this jumps around a little bit to, to overseas. This must've been a USO oh, sh yeah, show this here. This is a great one right here. Cause here's a picture of Bing, uh, Bing, Bing Crosby in 1945. Uh, Vivian Leigh, who was a very famous um, actress of her day and was part of the USO tour. Um, and then there's Mary Churchill there, who was uh, Winston Churchill's daughter. daughter yeah. So um, ha having a talk, uh, which is pretty cool there. Uh, these are some pretty, it's pretty cool pictures of, uh, um, he, he took a picture of the 533rd Squadron. Now, I don't know, because I, I tried to send away to the National Archives to get his records. Um, and he unfortunately found out that his records were lost in the in the fire that they had, I think, in the 1970s, was so, it? Uh, 67 or 1967 or 70, like somewhere around there. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to um get his record so i'm kind of piecing a lot of this together so i don't know if he was actually part of the 533rd squadron first um and then was they shifted into the 532nd when they got over to europe or whatnot but anyway he's got a picture of the 533rd could just be here it could just been there flying same, over it and they just saw it or know? they're the same they're so, more than likely in the same wing because the wing correct. we usually were like sequential three yeah numbers. they were in the same group for sure yeah. they were definitely in the same group um but this is cool to see like some of the the farming land and stuff um I thought it was funny that we numbered our, our units so high that the Germans would think, like, my God, they have 500 <laughs> wings. Uh, it's some of the construction equipment. I think that a lot of times uh, when we said early on in 42, they were just building the bases out there. I mean, so a lot, a lot of things were being developed. So there's a lot of equipment uh, that it took for them to build the air bases and, and whatnot for the training uh, for each of the squadrons to train before they went overseas. So I think a lot of these pictures are, are, are some of that, um, which is pretty cool. And, I, and I'm sure in early 43, they were still building quite a few uh, airstrips and and bases so. so so what do we think smashing times are these like so this, friends of his i don't know so so i wish i i wish i knew but this was a commissioning of a, of a new b-17 that that for that went overseas uh the smashing time i did look it up the smashing time was actually shot down Ooh. later on um during the war but uh this was the actual commissioning ceremony of it so like just like they commissioned ships and they commissioned everything else it, it was a tradition to commission each of the the new aircraft as they came in so obviously as as they the uh, Eighth Air Force experienced losses. They brought more and more aircraft and more and more crews in, and and as those new crews and aircraft came in, they would do a commissioning ceremony. I think it's a good luck thing too. So, but but this is the commissioning of the, the smashing time, um, and this is some you know some British guys. Uh, just as a, a British captain, that's all it says there, and and a uh, another British girl here who's who's speaking. Um, he's got some cool nose heart. Um, so so Miss Hot, uh, when, when she gave me these uh, pictures, she had mentioned that. Her father remembered, uh, well, she, she mentioned that uh, he was in the um, same squadron as the Liberty Bell. So here's a picture of the Liberty Bell, which, again, the Liberty Bell was used, uh, the name was used several times on several aircraft. So um, here's a cool one, the Joker, and then uh, Little Rock Ellie. So, all right, so now uh, we're looking here. This is the B-17s over Dakota, South Dakota. So when they were flying their, their their final training missions before heading over, this is some of the pictures of that. Again, he was he was a ball turret gunner, so he had he had an unobstructed view of uh, a lot of the formations and aircraft around him. Um, so these are pretty cool. There's a um, seventeen named Old Iron Gut. Yep, Old Iron Gut. Either that or it's, it's just calling it the Old Iron Gut. Maybe that was a the nickname they gave the B-17s back then. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. So. Um, um, and anyway, so so now we get into uh, Europe here. When we, s we shift over to here, st start looking at the bombing runs and, and some of the stuff. So uh, he, he had written on the back of all these these things. So like on the on the back of this one, he had uh, to the target. Um, so that's the B seventeens heading over to the target. Um, again, the three hundred eighty first bomb group. So um, then we get in a few more pictures here. Just you know, formation fly flying. Um, you know, maybe they were returning here. B seventeens over England, or maybe they're heading out one of the others. Um, and then uh, here's B-17s on the way home um, to England. So uh, a lot of this was, you know, just formation flying. There's a lot of training that they yeah, did. Looks like practice. Got, yeah, yeah, once they got to Europe, they continued their training. 
Um, and, and they actually, that was one thing that the 8th Air Force did really well, was they actually had a very robust um, training regiment in England once they got there to prepare them for a lot of their bomb missions. Um, so this is probably a lot of a lot of that training that they did, and he had an opportunity to uh, to take some pictures before they they enter combat. So, all right. So so here's where we get into some of the combat missions and pictures here. So we're we're starting to get into uh, you can see the vapor trails, and, and you can see how high that they were flying just by the vapor trails here. Um, it, it's it's pretty amazing. Man, imagine just being up there in thirty uh, minus thirty degree temperatures. Um, and a lot of boredom there too. Like the first couple hours of the mission, there's probably a lot of boredom going on there before they actually got over there, got near their target and had to look out for uh, between the flak and the fighters. So here you can start seeing some of the flak. He's got some cool pictures of uh, the, all these little black dots that you can see in here. Those, those are all, little, those are bursts of flak. Um, they don't, they don't look that imposing in the pictures, but um, you ask any, um, Anyone who flew through that stuff, and, and it, it's, it was a hellish nightmare for them. It's must have been later. I'm just noticing on the yeah. 17 here, you've got a Cheney tail turret, and it's all, you know, it's all aluminum mm -hmm. with the bright colors, so this is... It might have been later on, yeah. It, might have been it could have been later. late 44, so 45. That awful clean. They must have yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, his bomb squadron was there from, uh, you know, mid-43 all the way into, uh, you know, late 45 when, when they actually, um, when the war ended. So, um, they, they flew a lot of missions. And I do have stats on that here later. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So, um, you know, a couple of some some P thirty eights. He's got some pictures of P forty sevens and P thirty eights. So again, when we got back to we explained that early in the war, the P forty sevens and P thirty eights were the primary escort uh, fighter. Um, so yeah, the, the, the P thirty eights had the range, yeah. but they they weren't great fighters, and the P forty sevens were great fighters, but didn't have the range. Yeah. So so again, you know, they, they had those guys uh, until they got further and further to Germany. They lost their fighter escort, and that's where a lot of the the casualties happened from the the, the Luftwaffe. Um, and then once the P-51D came in, in uh, definitely the losses were, were cut down quite a bit because they were able to escort them. Um, now, these pictures here are, are some pictures. Um, I don't know if he took them or no, they're or archival, got, or they're archival photos. photos, but these are some of the, some pictures on, on missions here of, um, you know, unfortunately, some American bombers and aircraft uh, uh, being shot down. We, we talked about so, the, the B-26 for a while, yeah. the Marauder. It was, it was a very hot aircraft. It was not well liked by its crews. It had a high wing load. It was, you know, it, a little bit ahead of its time. Of course, the design matured with the A-26. This is a, that's an A-20. Yeah. That's, I was going to have a bad day. So. Here's some first strike photos. Yeah, and we got a few other, other pictures here. here here's a, here's a f uh, squadron of B-24s. You see um, here the smoke trail is what the lead bomber would have a, sm a smoke grenade tied to one of the bombs as it dropped. It'll leave this streak that would tell the rest of the squadrons to or the rest of the planes to bomb. Yeah. Yeah, and and the uh, the Eighth Air Force was primarily primarily consisted of the B twenty four Liberator and the B seventeen. So as you can see, there are pictures of both seventeens and B twenty fours here. Um, so here's another one here of a B seventeen. It looks like. And this one, I, I, th I don't know if that's a 17. Or yeah, that's a, something or, hurtling or, to the ground. Yeah, I can't tell if that maybe is a fighter that they shot down, or I don't know. So, so there's some original footage there on the left. Yeah. So, so here's here them all over the over the the target. So we we talked about the the bomb sites and, and whatnot. So you know, obviously they use bomb sites, and and typically the lead plane would drop their bombs, and everyone else would follow suit. As soon as they saw the lead plane uh, let, let go of their cargo. Uh, the, the rest of the, the flights would, rest of the aircraft behind them would actually drop as well. And here's some really good shots of uh, them actually dropping uh, their ordnance uh, on whatever target they were they're heading for. And then if you get over here, you can see some of the aftermath, actually the bombs, you know, after they've exploded and some of the, the plumes of smoke and whatnot here that are on the ground. So, um, and then some other pictures of formation flying. You know, I can imagine him looking at his his turret down there and just seeing these like silhouettes of B-17s below. Be I don't know if that was, bombs raining down on I don't know if that was on the return trip or on the way out, one or the other, but you know, hopefully they weren't directly below them. So all right, so some more photos here. So and again, th these are probably these photos here in particular are probably uh, archival photos. Uh, a, here are those are in B twenty four. Yeah. So uh, but you see some B twenty fours over the over the target. Um, some burning down on the, you know, obviously they hit their hit a target. I don't know if they hit the target, and that's the plus but they hit something. Yeah. So, but again, you see the flak in the background. Um, so, 
All right, and there's some really close-ups of some of the <laughs> dropping of the bombs there. So it's you would have had a great view of that. Yeah. So and then the carnage, you know, obviously you see, you can see down here that the craters that the bombs would leave. You can just see the how, how large the explosions were. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 This is this so. is Pilesti right here. You yeah. can tell by the smokestacks and the bombing. Uh, at the end, we'll have a little sidebar where we'll talk about Pilesti a little bit more. He's got some pictures of some of the damage and stuff around, uh, around Europe. I'm guessing this is probably late 45 or whatnot. You know, maybe after the war ended, he was oh, able yeah. to, I don't the know. So. To get it. But, um, you know, just some, some of the devastation from the bombing raids. Um, and then the rest of these pictures are just, you know, some, some pictures he had of, of some aircraft while he was in uh, Britain, I'm sure. These look like, uh, you know, British, uh, you said it wasn't a Lancaster, right? No, That's no, that is a, yeah. I want to say it's a short Sterling, I believe. Okay, all right. But some of the British fighters... Um, so, um, so, so Mr. Ott actually, um, I'm going to segue here for a second. Uh, uh Mr. Ott, uh, survived the war. Um, he decided to stay in the army. Um, the, in 1947, the army air forces became the air force, not just, not the army. They dropped the army piece of it and became their own, um, uh, branch of the service. And they, um, uh, he decided to stay in. Um, he actually became a warrant officer, um, at some point in the early fifties. And it was a W-2. Uh, he served in Korea. Once again, I don't have a lot of information on uh, his service in Korea, but I, I believe a lot of these photos here are, are him in Korea. Um, so I, I'm not sure where he was stationed. I'm hoping I'm still doing research on this grouping to, to uh, try to determine that. But um, so and then some of these are mixed into with England. So here, here's English countryside. So those still some of the pictures from, from World War II as well. Um, so, um, yeah, but, uh, unfortunately, um, he, he, uh, was, was a career military man. He ended up, um, um, serving, uh, into the, uh, into 1959. And unfortunately he, he passed away in uh, 1959 while he was still active duty. It wasn't in action, um, but he, he did pass away. Um, and he was actually buried at Arlington National Cemetery. So, uh, one of these days I hope to get up there and actually go uh, visit his gravesite and, uh, you know, pay a tribute to him. But, uh, um, it's pretty, pretty, uh, sad that, uh, unfortunately he, he never, um, his, his daughter never really got to know him that well. Uh, she was only two years old when he passed away and, uh, his wife, uh, was, and him were only actually married for five years before, uh, he passed on. Um, so, at, um, here, as we get into here, some of the medals that were his, um, the air medal here with two oak leaf clusters, um, so I mean, you know, third award, uh, of it. Um, it's actually engraved on the back with his name. And then he's got the, you know, Korean War Service Medal, the Victory Medal, uh, European Theater uh, Campaign. So, um, so yeah, these are these are the items uh, of uh, Mr. Ott here. So, uh, pretty pretty amazing uh, um, piece of history and a pretty amazing uh, collection of items here that I'm, I'm glad I was able to share with you guys. All right. Sorry, any questions? Let's see. It's... See, that, what I realize is I can't see questions on the camera <laughs> for some reason. What? Oh, uh, okay. What bombers were the most uh, desirable to fly? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, hopefully Jeremy can uh, help me out here on those. Well, but we, I, I we, guess the B-24, you know, was a was was a, definitely a good good aircraft to fly. Um, they, they used the B-24s throughout the Pacific as well in heavy numbers. Um, and the B-17s were, uh, were also very... Um, very reliable aircraft. Um, I don't know if they were preferred by by pilots over the B twenty fours or not, but um, those are definitely the two most um, utilized aircraft during the war. Uh, the B seventeens were obviously a little bit older than the B twenty fours. The B twenty fours were a little bit newer, a little bit more armament, had a little bit more capacity for bomb yeah uh, bomb cargo. But the B seventeen is more traditional aircraft. Yeah. Um, the B twenty four was a stark departure from traditional aircraft. Uh, twin tails, mm -hmm. high wing, not low wing. Um, the B-17, from all the information I've seen, was very desirable to fly. It was easy to fly. It was um, easy on the rudder, easy, easy on the controls. It responded well. It, it, would, sit, it, would, it would fly like a two-engine bomber. It would fly like a much smaller aircraft. Um, like he had said, though, the B-17 was kind of antiquated equipment when the war broke out. Uh, it had been flying in some form or another since 1932, 36 in that form, and they had tried to update it by you know, changing the weapons layout, mm -hmm. by adding this and adding that, uh, adding computerized gun sights. But 
by 42, 43, much more advanced aircraft were on the way. Of course, the B-29 was in the production yeah. at this point. And there were actually several other aircraft that were never even heard of. The, the yeah. B-32 Dominator um, was one. And uh, that was an aircraft that went and took the B-24 and the B-29 and kind of comboed them together and made this hybrid bomber that, unfortunately, they made thousands of them and flew them straight to the boneyard because the war was ending. But the B-17 never really saw much service in the Pacific. Um, its range and bomb load didn't preclude it. The B-24 is more popular in the Pacific. And of course, the advent of the B-29, the B-17 was pretty much uh, antiquated at this point. Yeah. But it was much more desired to fly over the B-24 because the B-24 had a reputation, rightfully so, perhaps, of being a widow maker because with the high wing you couldn't belly land it if mm -hmm. something had gone wrong with your hydraulics which had, for anyone who works on old cars and or anything else that knows the hydraulics it's a very finicky thing yeah. one leak and nothing works yep. so if you can't drop your landing gear or lower your flaps it makes yeah. life a lot more difficult the b-17 being a, a low wing aircraft it allowed it to skid into the ground without you know if the b-24 did it it would flip over and the wings yeah. would break and and, and whatnot yeah. Unfortunately for the ball turret gunner, that was <laughs> always the first land on B seventeen. He yeah. never did well, and there, there unfortunately were were documents of you know ball turret gunners um, being trapped, unfortunately, and they um, <sighs> you had the belly land. So, okay, we have a good one here. A recent online debate was on how much ammo was carried for each gun. I remember seeing aluminum overcast several years ago. I saw the wood bins that contained the ammo. I vaguely recall being told that each gun would only carry enough ammo for about. Oh. <laughs> Stand by one second there. I can't see the rest of the question. But I can, I can, I have this. In fact, I probably stood up and answered your question. Yes, I did stand up and answer your question. <laughs> this is right there. Let's see in the background here. Oh, I'm sorry. Enough ammo for about a minute if sustained fire. How much ammo per gun did they carry and were the crews able to carry extra ammunition as well? Okay, so this being, this being in our gallery here, as I fumble around with the controls, we have here, ta-da, <laughs> one uh, standard crate of ammunition. Ha! Why is that not look so, oh, there we go. I forgot, we were slightly behind. <laughs> there we go. All right, so here you have, Chris, one standard wooden crate of ammunition, 265 rounds of 50 caliber. Stand by one second. To get back to how much how much they carried, though, you have to keep keep in mind they, they calculated the weight, the the capacity that they could carry with the bombs, etc., uh, almost down to the to the round and to the ordnance that they carried. So like they were limited to the amount that they could actually carry on board. Um, so okay. typically, if they could fit more on there, they could, but typically there wasn't room or weight enough um, allowance for them to carry more than they were allotted. So here is fifty rounds. A 50 caliber. Um, it weighs about 25 pounds. So this is just 50 rounds. This obviously carries 265 rounds. It says the cubic weight on it is 99 pounds. So 50 rounds. Yeah, 25. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. so four belts of this in here weighs about this. So aircraft, it's all about weight. It's all about weight. So. I don't know what the standard emission load was per gun. I know it's probably less than a minute, but remember you're firing a three round burst. And so you're trying to conserve ammunition. Um, I know they did carry ex I know they did carry extra crates of this on board and that um, it would be whatever gunner was not currently engaged its job to run to wherever it was stowed and throw another crate in front of the guy trying to fend off the uh, Luftwaffe there. Um, I will look that information up for you, practice load per gun, and post it on here later. But this is the actual crate that you're asking about. Um, I love these crates. They're like one of my favorite things. <laughs> and these are actually a belt of live 50 cal. Yeah. This being made in 1962. But yeah, so there is your standard disintegrating belt of 50 cal. This is one of the things that we have here in plenty. Let's move this. All right. Ugh. We had talked about um, 
the different upgrades of the B17 for a while. And I got it. And uh, there was at one point a YB, I think it was a YB40. That was a gunship version of the mm -hmm. B17 where they took and they uh, put the chin turret on it. it had a top turret. It had a second top turret where the radio compartment okay. was. It had twin 50s in both windows and then the 50s in the, in the blister in the nose and then twin 50s in the tail. The only problem was is that the weight of the actual machine gun ammunition was so heavy that it actually Reduced slowed, the, pl slowed yeah. the plane down. <laughs> so that, yeah. I think we got our questions. So hold on a second. All right. I'm sorry, folks. I don't know why our uh, question bar is not advancing automatically. All right, I think we're good. Okay. All right. So, if you have any other questions, you know, please please go ahead and post. Yeah, these them are now. great questions. Um, please, please give us more questions. I can go all night. So, if you want to see any of those other pictures again, I can I can show you to you again. If you, you tell we'll me what we'll you try like to, to scan a whole bunch of these and um, and post them at various intervals. We had talked briefly about the Palesti raid. Now, Palesti was in Romania, and it was really the only, as, I, as in the booming voice from the sky here, <laughs> as, um, was the only large-scale refinery the Germans had in their possession, obviously, because Romania yeah. you know, had during the Axis powers, and it was their job to, to um, destroy it. Well, we're going to go dynamic here with the camera for a sec. Hopefully not break it. There we go. That's why we pay all the money for the gimbal system. And right here, we have this uniform set. This is a this is a uh, complete personal made job. This is of this gentleman right here. His name is Captain Naimi Farage. He was a second lieutenant at the time, later a captain, and he flew on a B twenty four. Liberator named Nobody's Baby. Nobody's Baby flew out of Italy. It completed 25 missions. It flew in the Palesti raid, which was, for those looking it up, was uh, terrible for the uh, Air Force. There was heavy casualties. It was a very valuable target, though. It was very worth it. Um, he flew as a bombardier on that mission. He was reputed, he was reputed to be the best bombardier in his squadron, which was the 300 or 465th Bombardment Group. And um, Palesti, by the way, was called Operation Tidal Wave. He uh, distinguished himself with several awards, including the uh, Flying Cross and um, uh, two air medals for his time in the hot seat. Known as the hot seat is the bombardier seat, known as the hot seat. He would, and there's his photograph right there, he would rotate back to America on his 25th mission and was slated to become an instructor. Well, he didn't want to do that, so he actually resigned as a bombardier and then joined fighters and ended up being a P-51 pilot. Sad thing for Nobody's Baby, on, the, on a mission just two weeks after he rotated, Nobody's Baby was shot down on a mission. And um, reports are conflicting, but it looks like at least seven of the crew were killed. Three of them survived in a PW camp. The pilot of Nobody's Baby, this is over Black Hammer, by the way, the pilot of Nobody's Baby, Cecil Bates, who was the pilot when Naimi there was the bombardier, he actually would be awarded posthumously, mind you, the Distinguished Flying Cross for keeping the burning bomber stable enough for his crew to, to bail out and in doing so sealed his own fate at the same time. Again, the losses the 8th Air Force experienced during the campaigns in Europe were paled in comparison to uh, April else. And remember that the entire United States Marine Corps in the Pacific lost fewer men than the 8th Air Force did. They try not to step backwards off the stairs and kill myself. Yeah. If any of you are wondering what this large apparatus is here, we talked about the 50 cal, we showed you the ammunition for that. This right here, which is filling the space very nicely, is the M4 auto cannon. The M4 auto cannon was a 37 millimeter fully automatic weapon, and it was fitted to one aircraft alone, the P39 Aero Cobra. 
it had extremely low muzzle velocity, um, a pronounced bullet drop, but the weapon was absolutely devastating. It took one hit. 37 millimeter, one hit, that was it. Yeah. And it was old painless. If you um, follow me up here, you can see this one was recovered from Russia. This is an actual gun. It was cut apart as a, tra as a trainer. So they removed all the plates from the outside. They cut the breech here. And this is the actual, this is the, this is the ammunition loading uh, apparatus. There's a whole clockwork of gears in here. Fired by a vehicle solenoid that sat in here, electrically fired, pulled this little switch right here, so it fired it. And for those of you wondering what the P-39 was, it would be that aircraft right there. You look at the very nose of the spinner, you'll see that that is the main gun. The P-39 was a, was a pre-war design, and it was loathed by American pilots. It was, in fun factoid, it was the only aircraft, it was the only aircraft to have a transmission. Oh. <laughs> so you literally sat on a giant transmission and, and because the engine was in the rear. Yeah, the engine being in the rear caused it to uh, have a very distinct flight profile, kind of like my stick handling here. And um, before its time, uh, it had a door, like, 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 like the, the, the way you got into it on the side, it was a door, yeah. like, like a house door. The only problem was when you're flying, yeah, a, 400, right yeah, you're yeah. flying a 400 miles an hour, you couldn't open yeah. the door. Yeah. So it had, a, it had a release that would have ejected off the side. Then you just got up out of your seat and stepped out the door. <laughs> but um, the Americans hated it. The Russians loved it. And uh, for those of you in the Virginia Beach area, on December the 18th, we'll be taking this gun down to the Pungo Airfield and the Military Aviation Museum and partnering them back up. You'll have, see this gun next to the aircraft that actually went in if you come out and see us down there on the 18th of December. It's a Sunday. This gun was restored here at Ghost of the Battlefield. It was received in a complete block of rust and has been meticulously cleaned and put back into order. Um, if I was a gorilla, I could actually <laughs> cock the handle on this sucker, but it's pretty fierce. This is the round that went in it. You see my hand for uh, size. It's a fairly large round. Of course, that's a blue training round. Right we have here what the actual round would look like. And yeah, so again, this is our little air core room here on it goes to the battlefield. And note the absolutely hideous paint color. That's actually historically accurate for airfields in England. They had this color. I don't know what the name of it would have been, but every inside of every building was painted this color. Half up the wall is this forest, the emerald green, followed by this, uh, we'll call it, you'd even call that chartreuse. But um, yeah, every building in England on airfields was painted this color. And if you go down to Pungo, the military aviation, you assume they actually had the same colors on their tower down there. For here we have a very nice jacket that's been peeking in and out of the scene all night. This is the uh, jacket. Of Mr. Walter Kutchik. He was a C-46 pilot, the commando. He flew over the hump in China, Burma, India. He was a cargo pilot. And he, uh, again, more lost history. He had passed on. We got very little of the information out of him, too. But his jacket is preserved, so that's something, I guess. All right. So the thing about does anyone else have any other questions out there? I see you're all still watching. If not, um, it has been an honor and a privilege presenting tonight again. Yep, and thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah, yep, it. Yep, yep. See, we've managed to talk for an hour again. Yeah. So our batteries are probably dying. <laughs> dying as we speak. <sighs> okay, so going forward, what do we have coming up? Next week we have a... Uh-huh, Okay. <laughs> We have a uh, comment from the peanut gallery. Oh, wow, and a dollar. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we have a comment from the peanut gallery. Ooh, I think the peanut gallery should come down here and talk about it. Yeah. Didn't think so. All right. One second. 
Let me get back out. Can we bring it over? No, I'll just I'll move the camera. Hilarious. All right. So of all the mannequins in the store, this is the most fought over one. Um, I'm gonna scoot in there next to that ugly light, but we'll get it done. All right. During World War II, and you know what? I'm, now that I'm thinking about this, we're gonna have to do our own presentation on this, and someone else is gonna have to present it. As someone who I'm showing me nameless. Okay. So we have. We have swipe left to reveal. Come. Oh, I can finally see people talking. How about that? That's great. Um, it's like a camera problem. I couldn't see people talking the whole time. <laughs> so anyway. Um, all right. During the war, pilots were needed for combat around the world. And as with the factories and as with production and as with all other aspects of the war, America turned to women to fill the role. The call was put out that pilots were needed. And believe it or not, even for the 1940s, there were quite a few qualified women pilots. In fact, there were thousands of them. And so, watch me juggle a chainsaw and a rat and a bat and a cat. All right. So there was a call put out for women pilots and they all came together at Avenger Field in Dallas, Texas. Women from all walks of life. There was uh, some Chinese. There was uh, quite a few uh, South American Latinas and, um, and others. And they were brought together with the express purpose of forming a women's air corps or air service, excuse me, that would provide ferry services for all of the tens of thousands of aircraft coming off the production lines of Willow Run and Bell Beth Page and uh, all the big factories around Sacramento. And they would go to these factories, pick up the aircraft, and then ferry them to their forward location in the country. They never left the country. But they would ferry them to the furthest point they could go. Um, they also performed lots of other missions that were considered secondary target towing, flight instruction, aerial gunnery instruction, primary instruction. I can only imagine being a, a rookie recruit aviator and showing up for my first day and like, oh, my instructor's a girl. <laughs> great. <laughs> this is going to go well. But they were great pilots. They were instinctive pilots. Um, women have a natural sense of balance that's better than a male's. They have a faster hand-eye coordination, quite typically speaking. And there was all these thousands of women that proceeded to Dallas, Texas. They tried out they went through a rigorous uh, selection process, and they become known as the WASPs. The WASP stands for the Women Army Service Pilots, and they chose for their mascot a gremlin, because aircraft were rumored to always crash because of gremlins. And look at me. And they chose the Fifanellas as, as their logo. A Fifanella is a female gremlin that would be a harbinger of good luck. It would keep the male gremlins, of course, because they're males, it would keep the male gremlins uh, occupied, and they wouldn't trash the airplanes. <laughs> um, they flew tens of thousands of hours of the most monotonous and sometimes dangerous duty, flying either brand new aircraft or sickly aircraft back for maintenance. Uh, they got they got the they got the the bad jobs, you know, and you know dozens and dozens of them died. But you never hear about them. In fact, they were never even recognized as a military service until I believe President Obama peanut gallery. Until President Obama recognized them as a military service and granted them retirements and medical bonuses. Of course, at this point they're all in their eighties, so you know thanks. But no thanks. And over here we see our rendition of a female wasp pilot. She wears her World War II aviator's flight suit with her wings pinned to her chest, her silver wings pinned to her chest. And their uniform was not like you imagined. It was simply a white collared shirt. That's all they wore. This along with their um, flight coveralls and 
They're, I believe that's called a schneed. Schnood. Schneed. Schnood. And then your typical flight gear, leather, flight ticket. We will do a whole series on them to, to appease the gods of the ghost of the battlefield here shortly. So that's on the docket. Uh, give it a couple weeks for research and, and whatnot. And there's a lot we can talk about with them. Um, next week, what we have coming up is, like I mentioned, we have in December, we have the live demonstration down at the airfield in Pungo. We have a couple more live shows coming up. Um, next week, I will probably be doing an impromptu show on the M1 Garand, which uh, will always be fun. I will get my finger stuck in it just for you, just for the, just for the crowd, <laughs> just one time. And we also, I believe we have a, a great series coming up on the, on the military 1911. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover the 1911 from its inception of 1911 all the way through its last uses in the 80s. And we have a gentleman, Dave Hall, who's going to come and present that for us. And he has every one of them, you know, even the rare ones. And we'll have that coming up soon. Stay tuned. Um, thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. I, I, thank you for calling me awesome. And um, that... Uh, we have pretty much exhausted our 8th Air Corps. I'm forgetting something. I'm totally forgetting something. I'm forgetting a big thing. Where is the booby trap? Behind you. Oh, there you go. So, um, we had done a lot on... Thank you. We had done a lot on nose art this week. Obviously leading up to this 8th Air Force bomber campaign, um, exhibition. And... So what, uh, one thing that I do, I'm kind of an artist myself, and I do flight jackets. Now, this flight jacket, remember I told you that story about, let me get all up in your face on this one. Remember I told you that story about my parents taking me to the air show when I was 10 or 12? About the same time, I believe it was for my birthday that year. In fact, my mother, I know you're watching, I can see dad on there. Give me a thumbs up, mom, familiar out there. My mother bought me this flight jacket um, for a kid of 10, a rather expensive gift. Uh, even in 1980, whatever that was, eight, um, I just dated myself, <laughs> 1988, it was still about 300 bucks if I remember. Uh, it's a very nice reproduction. It has all the internal markings that the original jacket had. Okay, made out of the right goat skin material. Um, the only thing that that excuse my friend sucked about it was it had this this bad applique on the back and so what i have done is since i've lost weight and can wear the jacket again mostly i um went ahead and i picked the bomber at random and i redid the jacket and i chose the bad dogs of the 409th bomb squadron or no bomb group and the 850th squadron they flew both B-24s and B-17s out of both England and Italy, so you can cover all the bases. And I chose the bad dogs. And the plane, now this is what I'm gonna do next week, is I have another jacket, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to paint it live on TV for you. Is and watch it. Why is everyone grinning? Watch watch the feed get killed. <laughs> okay. We might get the feed killed here on this one, so just just bear with me. Um, this this jacket is promptly known as booby trap and that was a real bomber you can look it up this is a historic thing <laughs> it's it's just a great jacket and i'm going to paint another one like it and we're going to do a little live series on that and also we'll do them on all the leather flight jackets there's only about six thousand different kinds and um yeah that's something else that's going to come up we can either do it through photos or we can do it live or part of it live but um Remember, you always got to have your Acme Thunderer whistle attached to your lapel in case you go out in the water and need to blow the whistle. All right, so that, I think, is pretty much it for this evening. I'm surprised the feed hasn't been killed yet. But uh, coming to you live from Ghost of the Battlefield's Army Air Corps display. Uh, and up here, and can't forget our guest tonight, Dan Con. You'll see him some more. He's got his glasses back on so he can see you this time. <laughs> and so um there's no other questions very informative thank you robert hope to see you again and we are gonna sign off for this evening keep keep it 
tuned to that dial. We're going to have a whole bunch more presentations. I'm going to do the Johnny Carson thing and throw the pencil at the camera here at the end. And if uh, that's not, is there anything else you want to add? No, thank you all. good? It was a good thank night. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for coming. We'll do this again shortly. And if you're all ready, good night.